Um, okay, so uh, welcome to uh, Showcase uh, 2. And um, Tori, um, you're, uh, you, so you can eat, present from your computer if you want to, or if you'd prefer, um, I could share my screen and I can present from my screen and you can just tell me when to, um, when to advance the pages, which would you rather? And you're muted. Sorry, not, I had yeah. the wrong screen up. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. That's totally fine. Okay. Um, let's see what I've got going on. I've never actually done this before, so we'll do that. I think I can figure it out. All okay. right. Okay. Cool. So the um lesson that I created is um based upon one of my favorite ELA teaching lessons um, that I use concurrently that um was called See Think Wonder. And what I did was um, show a photo that was um, something to do with a real life event that had happened or real people. And I would ask the kids, what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? And I've adapted this to be, um, what can we do to help? So I'll go ahead and skip to the next slide. So some lesson objectives here, teach the students to recognize emotions using the nonverbal cues. Um, by using the explore, oops, sorry, um, stage power. And then to also help students create empathy by discussing positive ways to comfort a person in stress or use stress. So I would begin the lesson by talking about ways to recognize emotion in people. So we can look at the way that a person looks happy. People will smile, laugh, look at us. Mad or angry people could frown, furrow the forehead, cross their arms, turn their back at us, yell. Sad people cry, frown. Surprised people may have big eyes, open mouth, gasp, step away. Calm people may not smile or frown. And they may be still and not say much or breathe slowly. So to intentionally teach those cues, nonverbal cues that people may express, that could help figure out how they feel. So I've had to pre-teach this quite a bit to really get kids to figure out what is it that you see? That tends to be actually the hard one for a lot of kids because it's just what are the actual things? So I see a girl, I see an ambulance, I see a tree, whatever it may be the actual facts of a situation. Um, and then what do you think? This is when we can start to get into the emotion. I think they are sad. I think that they are happy. I think that they had a fight with their friend, something along those lines. And then what do you wonder? And then this is where I would connect to um, an as if is what I would call it. So what could have happened to you that you may be able to relate to this emotion of I um, got in a fight with my mom and it made me feel sad. So I wonder if they maybe had a fight with their mom or something along those lines. And then of course, what can, how can we help? Um, and of course that's going to vary by the thing. So I've put together just a few examples of kids here of this first child is obviously a small child who is, um, upset. So what do you see? I see a little child. Um, she it has her eyes closed. She's laying on the floor. What do you think? Oh, I think she, maybe she's mad. What do you wonder? Well, I wonder if she ate breakfast, whatever questions may arise from there. And then how can we help? So um, maybe we could offered this child a hug. Maybe we could bring her her favorite toy. Maybe we could bring her her blanket. Maybe we could get an adult involved. Something along those lines. Obviously this child is, you know, probably didn't get their way. You know, I've got a few of them this mm -hmm. age at home. <laughs> but then this next child, I like this one in that it was a little different. This isn't a child who's obviously in distress. Um, this may be that child who's more along the lines of surprised. Um, so what do you see? I see a child with those big eyes. She's got her hand over her mouth. Um, what do you think? Uh, I think maybe she's scared. I think maybe she's upset. 
Um, what do you wonder? To me, this looked like a child who maybe swallowed something that they shouldn't have um, or something along those lines. Now, how can we help that person? Again, we can get an adult. We can um, help by whatever that may look like for this particular situation. And then this one was also different in that this is that child who's not expressing a lot of emotion. So this could be a great opportunity with this photo to say things like, well, how do we help a kid like this? What might they be feeling? Well, maybe they're feeling sad and just teaching kids that sometimes people who maybe aren't crying can still be sad. Or maybe this child had a rough morning at home. Well, what can we do to help? Again, um, offering them a snack, inviting them to play with us, whatever that may be. So um, I think I only had the three examples here. Yeah, that's all I had. But uh, this was always a great opportunity to really open up dialogue and discussion with my students for all sorts of different photos. Um, and I thought that this was a great opportunity way I never considered to use the strategy to teach an SEL lesson. Really, really cool photos showing different um, em emotional states. Um, so, you know, and I think, um, you know, getting kids to explore and do this in a way that's completely non-threatening, you know, it kind of gets them to relate things that these other, you know, other kids are feeling um, or doing or crying or, you know, crying out for help or whatever. And then um, through the discussion, you get to link it to things they themselves are feeling and things that they see in the classroom. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it kind of gets kids out of limbic mode to be able to discuss emo emotions of other kids and of themselves and allows a teacher or, you know, you, you, you know, you as a teacher or, or any other teacher to then like, um, bring the, discu the, the those discussions to whatever learning points because you could use this for a lot okay whatever learning points you want to um you want you want to make for the, for the kids really cool thank you so thank you uh so so tammy schrader like you have to comment now you know i i just want to tell you this is so powerful um because like you know the pictures worth a thousand oh. words whatever whatever but the bottom line is teaching kids that what do you see, what you see and what you think about what you see are very different. Like that, especially that, I'm looking at that last little boy, you can make a lot of inferences, but the truth is until we know the story, we don't know the story. And even the little girl that looked like she was throwing a tantrum, you don't know that she just hasn't had the worst day of her life, whatever that looks like to a two-year-old, right? Um Anyway, I just think I just think the picture idea is powerful. And by the way, can I steal it? Mm. Mm. Thank you. Actually, Tammy, I, I believe I got it from the idea from a um is it Abby who used to work for uh -huh. ESD? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think she taught it once at a um an ELA PD that I attended years ago at this point. Yeah, I'll tell her. I'll let her know. But I it's lovely. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thanks. So the problem is now, Tori, you've set the bar high. Okay. So um so who else want who who wants to present next? Mitch? Yep. Uh this yep. is Lee Kenny. I've been trying to email my um presentation and I don't know if it ever came right. through. Yep, yep. I I uh yes, I um it did. Um, so I can show it on my screen if you want, or you, you know, that would be great since okay. my technology hasn't been the greatest. Of course. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me go to, uh, present mode and then share my screen and you'll just have to tell me when to advance. Okay. 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 So I went, uh, Okay, I went the other direction uh, to teach uh, K2 what mindfulness is and techniques to control their feelings. Go ahead. Oops, did I? Oh, did... 
Did it not come through? Uh, wait a minute. Oh, you know something? I just clicked on the wrong thing. That's okay. Oh, one second. Um, there's probably, yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. And so we start off with their feelings and how they're feeling. And it goes into a go noodle. And it's a melting exercise where they feel frozen in time and they're slowly melting, melting, melting their feelings and um, just getting in touch to where, how their body feels. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Oops. I wasn't going to show the video. So, okay, go ahead. Okay. This is peace. This is I am peace book. Uh, it's a really short read, but it's a book of mindfulness. And it um, basically describes how a little boy feels and um, how things around him feel. And he ends up uh, sitting by a tree. So he um, communes with nature. And so give some options of how to feel peaceful. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm, a, I'm gathering also that you show the video. And then after each video, you may have a discussion with the kids about the video, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, of definitely. Okay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Yeah. And you may have said and that. And then the same. And then the same with the book to tell, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what what group it is, to tell um, either the beginning, the middle, the end, what the characters are doing, uh, what happened to the character, and um, what okay. their response to it would be. Mm -hmm. And then how to relax their body. Yoga is one way. Mm -hmm. And this video is, is quite long, so I would only use parts of it. Uh, but this starts with the breathing exercises. That's really um, important for them to be able to feel their stomach expand and to breathe in and out. Next. Go ahead. And then we would do a managing anchor chart where they would show strategies of what to do when they feel sad, mad, hurt, or fear. And up to this point, they would have lots of strategies now, either the breathing exercises, uh, calmly sit under a tree, look at the sky, um, all the things that they learned in the book, or try the melting exercise they learned from the video. And we would use sticky notes, and they would put how they're feeling and what they could do under different and i just wrote in a few things that they might suggest and they might even have more of in this mm -hmm. go ahead and then um to just be yourself and to get to know yourself and uh eft tapping has become quite large um a community in the United States now and maybe worldwide, I'm not for sure. But this is a tapping video for kids, how to learn to tap. A lot of kids will um, rock or bang on things or whatever. And this is to use your body for those motions. And so it's something you always have with you. Um, fidget toys are huge right now. They're popping little balloons. They're um, they're shaking little rattles. They're doing, and this is a process that's kind of like a fidget toy, only that they can tap themselves um, uh, through their emotions to see how they feel. Go ahead. And then, so that you just recognize that what is important is the here and now. I am safe. I am calm. I am happy. Hmm. That's it. Great. Okay. And try not to be too overwhelming for K2 because they get restless. Mm -hmm. Even when they get engaged, they can only stay engaged for so long. Right. Right. So it, sometimes you might have to use portions here and there. And the thing is that kids are watching videos all the time. So this is kind of the way they're used to, to they're most used to bring bringing in information, right? So it kind of it it is. Te teaches what it's... the way they're used to learning on their own. Right. I was in a TK room today and they were totally engaged in watching Bluey on the the TV, but sit get them to try and sit down and listen to an actual story, storybook, mm -hmm. um, is a lot more challenging. Yeah. 
And then what I think, you know, seeing as how you give them some things that they can do in advance and then have them look at situations where they might use those those um, those techniques and that that kind of anchors them so that they're prepared. And even if they don't come up with it on their own, like, oh, yeah, I could use yoga or oh, yeah, I could use peace or oh, yeah, I could use tapping because they've already thought of it and they kind of have a cubbyhole for it, it's a lot easier for you as a teacher to say, oh, if you're feeling this, do you remember we, you know, you talked about yoga right. or, you know, it's just like, oh yeah. And it's, it's, it's a quick recognition. Uh, it really get you know, it, it prepares them with the tools and to use the tools. That was really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And a thumbs up from Tammy. Any other, any other comments? Well, what I loved is, you know, when I, the minute you start talking about the fidget spinner, it just makes me smile. We don't get to pick what motivates kids. And if uh, I got to be honest, I don't get it. But that doesn't mean they don't get it. And I love seeing that. I love that this is totally kid centered and it's about what, what they're about. So I was, I, it was, that was amazing. Thanks Lee. Thanks Tammy. Thank you. Okay. So who wants to present next? Okay. And John. John for attendance do we know john's last name hi john sorry to bother you yes um john glenn yeah oh i found you sorry john okay. uh okay so uh john do you do you want to present on your sure i'd be happy okay to Are you going to put that up? For oh, me? that's what I, I'm sorry. What I meant was, do you want to show it on your screen or do you want me to oh, show it? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Okay. No. All right. So let me, um, let me find. Oh, I don't think. Oh, yes, there it is. Okay. Um, okay. This is going to take me a second. Right, maybe. There we go. Okay. So let me share my screen. Okay. So prior to COVID, I was doing quite a bit of work with school districts, talking about the Compassionate School Projects, SEL, complex trauma, um, chronic stress, and how to take those ideas and uh, get teachers to think maybe a little differently about why students were possibly behaving the way they were behaving. So this is a modification based upon what, what we've learned in the last few weeks, Mitch, of that work. I'm not convinced it's going to work, but we'll try it. So if you could move forward. Next, yeah, next slide. So I usually start this presentation on the east side with a picture that says this is a long and arduous journey and we don't know exactly where we're going. But if we follow the dog, we'll get there. And it gives folks a little bit of an idea about who I am. And it begins to build a connection, which I find essential if I'm going to get people to look to think about this work. Next slide, please. And I talk briefly about the purpose. And I'd normally do this. This would take anywhere from five days over the course of a semester to two days in a row. Most commonly, I would do this pro presentation in a half day. But this is designed, this this would probably take three to four hours or two hours to do. And it's designed to be a brief introduction to how trauma, chronic stress, and the experiences can impact how students react to their school experiences. Um, and it's it's just starts to offer some ideas of how you might reach students who are under duress. And you may not, you may or may not agree with the assertions I'm going to make. Next slide, please. So thinking about mind framing, mind shifting practices to frame how uh, brain function impacts teaching. So what I've done is I've taken some work that I was doing and combined these with some practices from mind shifting um, and my research on trauma. And thinking about the stories we tell ourselves, our barriers, and as we proceed through this session, understand that even if you feel overwhelmed, you can do this work. You can break it into small tasks and you can pick it up one part at a time. Next slide, please. So 
mind shifting, I would strongly encourage my if I when I present this for folks to look into this, to look at the videos. Um, and and this lesson is really more about setting the stage than an application. So mind shifting, there's an here's an example of an arrow in the mind shifting quiver. And this can be used with anyone. And what I want folks to remember is that what is good for students who may be impacted by trauma and or stress is also good practice for all kids. So the idea that we're applying a treatment to kids who need help with an, a social emotional learning component does not mean that we should not apply that, that that's not good for everybody. And then the next slide, we would go through the I can't exercise. Um, I would explain that. And um, again, emphasize that we're not eating this elephant all in one sitting, but one bite at a time. And the next slide, please. And so why use I can't? And we talk about, um, we talk about, uh, we'll talk about perhaps I can and breaking down tasks can be a strategy. Understanding how the brain works can give you some insight in how to approach some students. And that's the part where I find that, that teachers um, may need some reminders and some help as they think about dealing with, with kids. So the next slide, this is really about um, holding space. So, so what I want folks to recognize is that we're not trying to fix or trying to impact outcomes for kids. What we're trying to do is we're trying to hold space for them as we open our hearts, offer unconditional support, and and let go of our judgment and our bias towards them. So the next slide is a quote from uh, a student at the University of Washington that says, when I was in college, I learned how to construct a good curriculum and I learned how to exercise, execute it, but I never learned how children learn. And so from there, we shift into um, a diagram of the brain that's different than the diagram you use, but it's basically the same that I can talk about the prefrontal cortex, I can talk about the limbic system, we can talk about what happens in our lizard brain. And, and normally when I do this, I do Dan Siegel's brain in the hand uh, video where I where I show uh, show that and then depending on how in depth I go, I would talk about a kid being flipped. And we actually try to teach that language where kids, even first, second, third graders, can can say, I'm flipped right now, or you're flipped, is what they more likely say. And then we, we go on to talk about the separation of psychology is, is it from biology um, is not possible. That's that's Carl Jung, that we are we are connected emotionally and physically. And then I go on, there's a Dreyker's quote that a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. And then one of my mentors, a kid will always be choose to be considered bad rather than thought stupid. So if we give a child a task they can't do, we can anticipate their outcome. We then give, do a review on the adverse childhood uh, experiences. We talk about how ACEs uh, worked and you know these were not people who uh, were were really poor? That was a very this was a very um, unusual group, and yet they still the the ACEs study still found that there was lasting impact to to folks who suffered these experiences. We then talk about what the adverse childhood experiences are. Um, so the next slide shows a graph of that, and that's again just a review. And then we talk about um trauma and it can co occur very early and have a lasting and cumulative impact and that it occurs um if it occurs very early it can impact how children are attached and interact with adults and i've got a couple of slides that show that cycle um, which i chose not to include here but what happens when kids are suffering trauma or chronic stress is the behavior we're getting is not necessarily the behavior that we're seeing and so we this can be defined as a as the mistaken behavior chart or it can, or here it's in this slide so you might see a, a child who becomes oppositional to you but that's because they're trying to avoid 
that connection based upon their experiences in the past. Then shift over and talk a little bit about stress, um, knowing that some stress is good for us, it can motivate us and it can inspire us, but that chronic stress is detrimental. And we talk about how chronic stress um, in the next slide uh, is particularly impactful in uh, from zero to adolescence. It impedes brain growth. Uh, it, if it's in intense, regular, and long term, uh, you can actually have, you know, and, well, next slide will talk about how you'll have impacts with your with language development, um, ability to attach, emotional regulation, cognition and language, and that survival always trumps exploration and growth, which is learning. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy, you find that, that you know, cognition's about the fifth thing up there. This is a really poor slide. I couldn't get it cleaned up. I got to figure out why not. But it shows that in kids who have chronic stress and, and are coming from adversity, that their zone of re resilience, the area in which they can control themselves, is much, much narrower. And they're much more likely to lose their stuff and to be out of a place where we can really work with them. And so it's important to recognize that if you have kids with high ACEs, that you you work with them um, in, a, in a different frame. So it's difficult for me to get some folks to recognize that these are other than anything other than excuses. But, you know, I acknowledge, all right, you know, my kids have ACEs and toxic stress, so suck it up is, is what we need to do because these factors change brain chemistry. These changes in brain chemistry are not fixed as soon as you remove the stress. And these impacts can be overcome through neuroplasty, but they but they it takes a long time, a lot of knowledge, a lot of patience, and very intentional instruction. So assuming um, so let's say so now you you're at that point where you you've accepted that these kids have this. So so what? Well, assuming you know the content of what you're doing and assuming that you can assess student competency around social emotional learning, what do you do now? And here's a change in this story where perhaps you need to challenge your story about these kids. You need to recognize that neuroplasty is um, it, it does exist and that if a bridge is down between two points of connection, specific experiences and teaching can inspire the brain to build new ones. And we talk a little bit about this. Um, and one of the most dangerous things we do is we assign attributes to people based on how we perceive them. People appear to us according to the light we throw upon them from our minds. And we need that as part of a story that we write and then a script that we use. So um, bias is just a part of who we are. And bias exists in people. It, in, it exists in institutions. It exists in systems. Bias is a uh, dominant. There's a dominant culture bias that we have to be very aware of. And we may not be aware that we're operating in bias or that we're operating from a story based on those biases. And so we need to stop. We need to recognize whether we're in that story and we need to change that story. Uh, the Pygmalion effect. This is a quote from, um, I just lost it, but from, uh, I can see it, a flower girl in, um, somebody in the audience will help me with this, but I'll always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I know I can be a lady because you always treat me as a lady and always will. And the point here is that we all have these common educational stories. Um, next slide, please. Um, that kid's from a bad family. That kid is not capable. Uh, that is how we've always done it. If we give up power, we lose control. This is just another fad, and, and et cetera. And those stories result in scripts. And we use those scripts to move to action without really stopping ourselves and thinking. So that's some... Um, 
And we tend to, in, in these scripts, we tend to ignore the information that's not consist, consistent and accept information that val, validates our story. So this next slide here, um, you know, his mama did not want him going with us and doing that, but uh, he was just fine. Um, so, if, you know, um, when you trust kids, give them some space and know where the hospital is, the work becomes a lot easier. So um, how do we get ready for real change? We recognize that all people support change as long as it does not require them to do or act any differently. Um, I've always had people say, yep, change is great. You just don't want make me do anything different. We recognize because of bias, experience, and habits that change is difficult. We make it difficult to retreat to old habits. We've got to blow up the old systems if we really want change. And we've got to set the stage for great teaching. Um, the Sullivan Trust, uh, Sutton Trust says that, they're, that those are the elements of great teaching. And so as we pay attention first to the quality of instruction, um, we, we've assumed we have our content knowledge. Next slide. Um, so these are the elements of, of quality instruction. Then we talk about teaching climate and its relationships, relationships, relationships. We do an exercise around achievement over effort and, and encouragement over praise so that uh, folks get to get to get up and move around a little bit. And we talk about allowing students to stretch their boundaries. Classroom management, we don't want to waste students' time. We want to set clear boundaries. We want to co consistently enforce expectations. We want to be reasonable. And being reasonable includes the fact that you may actually be wrong sometimes. What you believe about students and their, and their abilities is extremely important. This is why you have to challenge your bias. Uh, the Rosenthal study of 64 uh, is one example. Robert Panada, which folks don't, don't uh, hear very much about, that this was the guy who assigned, uh, went in, did tests, and, and then randomly assigned super IQs to a few kids and came back and found out that those kids who had those super IQs were actually treated much, much better by their teachers. Uh, again, it's relationships, rela even though they didn't have super IQs. Relationships, relationships, relationships. If you change your beliefs about kids, you will change your outcomes. Um, so if we treat students as if they can achieve, they're more likely to achieve, uh, and we must constantly be on guard of how we treat students because sometimes we don't know how our actions are perceived. And this is particularly true of dominant culture. Big white guys like me have a tendency to maybe be a little myopic in the way that we're looking at kids who may be different from me. Um, help each other. I usually have several stories about that. Act in a professional manner. Engage in your professional um, development. I think I misspelled liaisoning, but uh, take a more active role in communicating with parents. Finally, we talk about discipline. Our culture expects us to be dis to discipline based on a long history of action and belief. The result is often called as a punishment. The perception is that swift and stern action is effective and without it, chaos will reign. If we're to create compassionate schools, we've got to discard those beliefs and we've got to change, we've got to change the way we interact around disciplining children. So relations are about connections. To make connections, we must move from a culture of shame, blame, and punishment to a culture of connecting, understanding, and compassion. We've got to get, low, get let go of the past, and we must do this without enabling so that we can create truly transformational rather than transactional relationships. Here are the ways we connect. We go through each one of these. I give a few examples. Um, work as a team. We have an exercise that we do in some, some scenarios, tabletops that we do. And avoiding transactional agreements is often one that gets difficult, especially when school communities are engaged or really bound to PBIS. Um, yeah, that's fine. I was... Uh, here are some specific connections. We talk about each of these. We give some examples. And that, so 
Next slide. And then we talk about um, we talk about making connect the barriers. And and one of the things that folks don't do is how are we going to address the barriers of social emotional learning, especially the readiness of students to benefit. If a kid isn't ready to benefit from what you're doing, whether that's English or kindness, you cannot you 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 cannot be effective. You have to you have to really have the child in a place where they can benefit from that. And adults struggle with this as well. Next, is that it? I think I think that might be it. It says forty three right. and forty three. So yeah, that's that's it then. What? No. That's all. That's all. Huh. <laughs> wow, that's that's in, uh, that's incredibly complete and um real. You know, like I could just picture. You know, I can imagine you going into a school and and um the school starting a whole path of transformation based on you presenting that. We we were having some success through the rural alliance uh, with with a grant and and you know I'm I'm six six and I'm um, I'm a fairly imposing person and when I go in and talk about kindness it kind of flips people's strips a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's um you know as 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 you were going through the slides one of the things that hit me, you know, like we talk about, not you and me, but, you know, in general, the education system, you know, we have to reach, you know, reaching the average child, the normal child, or whatever that happens to be. But as your, you know, your data pointed out, if you're teaching a class of 30, that means that you probably have 10 to 15 kids who have experienced trauma, you know? Yeah, the, so, the Healthy Youth Survey actually addresses that, and I mm -hmm. think it's higher. I think that um, I actually have that slide. Um, oh, here it is. So these, this is dated, but um, out of a 2010 healthy 30 students, uh, six students with two aces, three students with three aces, seven students with four or five, and three students with six or more. And we know that uh, that you know two or more aces, we begin to see the the impact. So, so that's 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 pretty amazing. Have you, by any chance, read anything by Robert Cialdini? C i a l d i n i. No, so, that doesn't. So one of the that. things that's pretty cool about him is is he's, um, he's well, he's a psychologist, I believe, but he, he, he um talks about there's six ways of influencing people to do things, and. You know, obviously punishment is one of them, you know, or, you know, discipline, you know, um, but, you know, we, we very rarely use the other five and actually discipline and rewards are pretty much related. So one just happens to be positive, one happens to be negative, but it's, you know, you, it's not, I don't think it was that long a book, um, but I found it when I, I mean, I read it years and years ago and I still refer to it. So, C I A L D I N I Robert uh, Cialdini, and uh, I think his book his book is Say that again. Uh, Cialdini, um, C I A L D I N I, that's his last name, and the name of his book is Influence. Thank you. Um, I think you know you 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 actually anybody would probably find it fast fascinating but i certainly did so um yeah i'm uh, i'm i'm you know i'm always blown away by um by the lessons because people or you know what what you've done and um you know tori did and lee did as well is you take things that i've said but put them in a way that um other people can really relate to them and so thank you i, I think that was great Tammy, yeah, what do you and, think? Well, I just, I, can I just love you, John? Can I say that, Mitch? So, uh, sorry. And now it's on record because we're recording. Because, well, I know, I'm sorry. And I, I never say the appropriate thing, so I apologize. But I have to tell you, you have just this calming, and I can't, I can picture you being six foot something, but you just have this calming. Like when you first start presenting, I'm, 
it's almost like I could close my eyes. And honestly, <laughs> I'm dealing with my own issues in life. I know you can't, I know you're shocked. I know everybody's shocked, but, and when you're talking, I'm, I'm applying my own stuff to what you're saying. And then I'm realized, Oh, this is a presentation. He's not, he's not trying to help me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just got sucked in and I'm like, this guy is great. <laughs> so it was fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. And John, you say, you said rural Alliance, is that in Eastern Washington? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if you've attended, but we I have, yeah. and I, I don't remember you and I I'm trying to, place you well i've presented there several times but i was on the board I, in fact i was just talking to kevin this morning but oh really yeah so um yeah i i think we're having a convening very soon and i'd encourage everybody to to come if you well are you going to be there i will be there oh excellent i will make sure to hunt you down and okay. you'll probably recognize him because he'll be six six well <laughs> but here's the thing that room is full of people and the organization I work for, usually we just take a table in the back because we're just kind of supporting. But when you said that, I'm like, I go to that. I don't always go. And I certainly have not been since COVID. Um, but I've presented there as well. Anyway, okay. I just want to know where to hunt you down, John. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Um, so we've, we have time for a, a few more. Who wants to present next? I'll go. Okay, good. And do you want to show your screen or do you want me to show my screen? Um, I think I can share mine. Let me try to do this here. Okay. Here we go. Yep. You see it? So I went a little bit different. Um, I'm a paraeducator, so I don't actually come up with lessons usually, but I do work at a high school, so more adult aged kids. And I thought maybe I could do this for them or for my staff mm -hmm. and just kind of go through what I learned in this whole workshop. So um, I kind of went for the mindfulness and keeping a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And just a little graphic there for that. Um, I wanted to talk about gearing towards um, effective decision making, critical thinking, and creativity, and then um, how to break habits and become resourceful using the sage powers because I really liked those. Um, I did borrow one of your uh, mindfulness exercises as well with the breathing, and we would go through that first. Um, then the perhaps I can, and at some point we all say the, I can't do this and, um, we can tell ourselves perhaps I can, or I think I can, and then I can, or I will. Oh, I guess I lost my other little graphic there, but, um, the big decisions I put on there, the limbic system and how the decision-making on that part is, um, let me see if it printed out here. Um, it's made in 1 50th of a second. It might and be that if you click again, that there's a delay. Oh, there it is. There it goes. I guess I did something fancy and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, knowing that your limbic system has your heuristics, which is your fast decision-making and that's something that can be changed was a big part of what I went into. Um, we can change our thinking from, I can't do this or dealing with it later to maybe I can find a solution now. And then I just had. I found this graphic and it has um, the fixed and growth mindset and um, the fixed side showing this is too hard for a challenge and maybe a growth mindset of that is let's do it even though it's hard and just a bunch of different ones that we could go through there. Um, and then I went through the sage powers and just a quick uh, little 
display of what those are for each of them and how we could use those gifts or opportunities and simple choices when we have a problem and we need to come up with a solution. And then I just did a little thank you at the end, say calm, breathe, you can do this. Um, and perhaps you can. Wow. Wow, that, that captured a lot and really simplified it, you know, and, and uh, or made it more elegant, you know, uh, really, um, really good. And I loved Dweck's graph and I really loved your graphic of cutting the apostrophe T in Kant. Yeah. I like so that. Was, have you tried this with uh, to present this? Yeah, I haven't yet. We, um, I think I'm gonna see if I can do it at our staff meeting. That's on Tuesday. So my guess is you'll people will give you standing applause. It's, it's really really good. Thank you. So yeah, good good luck at the meeting, but you you'll do great. Thank you. And you know, I, so what I loved most was when you said, I, I'm going to bring this back to my staff and teachers and right, because we cannot do enough of this stuff, right? I don't think. And so I, A, I'm with Mitch. I love the graphics, but I just love leaving that you are going to take this on for an audience. And I guess my hope is I'm thinking you might want to also bring it back in the fall to remind people like we, yes, we can do that because teachers even have, I mean, it's not just kids have their stuff going on. Teachers have their stuff going on. And we're teaching in a, I feel like it's post-apocalyptic. I Every year I hear from all my teachers, Tammy, teaching is so much harder since COVID, right? Um, and and I think part of it is because kids have been home and and whatever. But even, even your yes, we can, even when people say yes, we can, or I, I was walking through a school and it, and everywhere I looked in this school, it said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And I asked the principal about it. I said, it's kind of cool even to walk through and just, continue. I mean, I'm going to the bathroom and I see the, yes, we can. Yeah. And it just changes the mindset to see that all the time, you know, because all the self-doubt comes in, but so yeah, loved it. Loved it. Thank you. Go, go get it. <laughs> yeah. Good. And thank you for, thank you for presenting. Okay, now who wants to present? Mitch, this is Annie. I can go. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, and I will share my screen. Okay. Make sure I'm getting the right screen here. Okay. All right. Are you guys seeing that okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, so I put together a presentation hoping that maybe we could share this with staff and uh, I think it was Lee who mentioned she works with kindergarten through second grade and they have a fairly short attention span and I think if there's any group who has a shorter attention span than K2 it's probably adults so um, I designed this to be short and part of maybe the beginning of a series of mini lessons to do either at a staff meeting or a PLC so uh, let's see if I can drive here um, nope, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Uh, hold on, stand by. Hmm. Well? I thought you were, you were sharing the right screen, actually. Okay, well, I have it up as a slideshow somewhere. Right. Maybe this will work. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what drives our students' behavior and how we can help them make lasting change. And I used this background because I saw it on a Canva and I've been saving it for something that felt more a little bit more adult and maybe calming. And if we were doing this at the end of a school day, maybe everyone would engage a little bit with the artistic nature. But um, So I wanted to start out just talking to staff about how we assume our kids' behavior works. So we assume something's happening or needs to happen. I think about what I should do. I decide what action I'm going to take and I take action. And the reality is it actually works like I behave according to a script I already know. And then my mind justifies and rationalizes my choices driven by a story 
that I believe about myself or my world, and it all happens really fast. So our students are navigating fast-moving, complex social situations using the current tools they have. And un if we understand how those tools work, we can help students use the tools they have better and maybe add new tools to their toolbox. So understanding the tools we all use, which are scripts, stories, and resourcefulness. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about each one. So scripts are automatic behaviors that we learn to use in certain situations. We don't think about what to do. We just act. Most of us, our students included, operate automatically for their physical actions, activities of daily living, academic functions, social interactions, using these scripts that we've already learned. So our students have more limited scripts based on their developmental levels and their life experience than adults do. Um, and then also, um, I made some notes to myself, like, Developmentally, our students have scripts that fall within a range of skills. So if you work with early adolescents or um, older students, then we also have students with disabilities. And then our scripts are also driven by our culture, um, maybe trauma. So within the automatic responses that we have, everyone's automatic responses are going to be driven by different scripts that they've learned based on their life experience. Scripts serve a useful function. They help us navigate throughout our day. So thinking of them as negative is not really uh, very helpful because if we had to think about everything we do all the time and we didn't rely on scripts, we'd be physically and mentally exhausted by the end of every day just by doing the basics. So scripts aren't bad, but scripts can be automated behaviors that don't serve our needs very functionally. So what do we know about behavior? Behavior is driven by automatic responses that keep us safe, they preserve energy, but when a threat is perceived, we act on things we've all heard of, fight, flight, freeze, habits, and sometimes blending in. And that's not one I think most of us think about on a daily basis, but it is what our teenagers do all the time. That's probably their default more than anything else, especially when they're interacting with their peers, doing what everybody else is doing. And that's when our brain really automatically relies on scripts. So the more perceived um, threat we have, the more likely we are to rely on scripts. And threats aren't necessarily like about safety. They can be about preserving social status, feelings of inadequacy, fear of losing something important, maybe being grounded for bad grades, getting my phone taken away, lunch detention for bad behavior, missing out with my friends. Our brains still see these as threats. So um, when are scripts unhelpful? So when we act on a script that doesn't match the current situation, or when we act on a script in situations that are way too complex for just using a script. So what do scripted behaviors look like in the classroom? And I was going to ask the staff for some examples. Chronic bathroom lingering, tardies, um, absences, skipping not turning in assignments even when they're actually completed and shoved in the backpack. We have students who still don't turn the work in, either because they forget, they hesitate, they're busy doing something else, or they're afraid. And the, the, if I don't turn it in, you can't tell me that it's bad. But if I turn it in, it might be bad. And then I was gonna ask the staff for some other examples they could think of. I predict that some of those examples that would come up would be being on their phones, because that is a chronic problem. So I left them an easy softball one to get an answer from the audience, um, talking to their neighbor, uh, disengaging in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's just staring out the window, but there's all kinds of disengaged or fight or flight things that our students do. And then I wanted to talk about stories being the narrative that's running in the background. So as we, as we are acting on scripts, the story is how we explain to ourselves why we do the things we do. And it reflects how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our world. So have you ever told the student, uh, hey, you didn't handle that the best way, or you shouldn't do that? And how did that go? <laughs> um, students get defensive when we challenge their script. But I will say that really works with spouses, right? You can just well, yeah, always, yeah, always that's just really spouse. effective. Right, yeah. <laughs> hey, honey, <laughs> you shouldn't do that. Right. Sure. Um, and reminding our, ourselves and our staff that scripts aren't intentional. Scripts are automated. So when we when we see students acting 
especially when they're acting very quickly, that script is an automated response. It's not something they thought through and intentionally did. I think there's a lot of intentionality that that we see it, that we label on behaviors that's really not intentional at all. And we take it personally. So we have a story and a script running about how kids are behaving around us. Um, and then, then the kids, you know, engage in a story that rationalizes the script. You didn't handle that in the best way. Well, that was all I had. Or my dog ate my homework. Or uh, my mom was texting me. I have to go to my grandma's. You know, d different things that they, they automatically talk about. The story that's in the background is, you're mad at me. Or you're out to get me. Or um, you think I'm a bad student. Or whatever it is that the students tell themselves. So stories are based in beliefs about ourselves, the world around us and they reinforce our scripts. And I, I thought it was really important to give some examples of stories so that, because it's kind of a vague concept if you don't have something to tie it to, but these are all ones that we're really familiar with hearing from students. I suck at math, nobody likes me, I'm fat. Or scripts or stories could be helpful if your story behind what you're doing is, no, I'm a good friend, or I'm actually smart, or I make good choices, or I'm good at sports. So depending on what the story the student has running in the background, it could be positive, but oftentimes we know if we're seeing a behavior we don't like, the story behind it is probably not a helpful one either. Um, so the, the way to help students rewrite their scripts is to engage their inner resourcefulness. And ideally, um, I think that each one of these would be a mini lesson in itself, talking about self-awareness, separately talking about mindfulness, and then talking, talking about constructive dialogue, just to give each one of those its own cognitive space. Um, but a little bit about each one. Self-awareness, like what kinds of emotions do I recognize in myself? Is this what I really want or am I just reacting? Is there a threat here or am I just feeling anxious? Um, I really like the mindfulness skills from DBT, and so I put a link to that. Um, they're observe, describe, participate fully in an experience. A lot of us have done a mindfulness exercise with a Hershey's Kiss and unwrapped it and, and gone through the whole process. A non-judgmental stance, so just looking at something and saying it, it does, it's not anything particularly good or bad. It is what it is. And then one mindful, like one thing at a time. Our students are horrible at that right now. Everything is what they perceive as multitasking, which is not really a thing. And then constructive dialogue examples that I think might be most useful with our students. Perhaps I can, yet I could try one step and see how it goes. What if something different was true? And that's especially in the social setting because kids come in with very loaded situations with peers and just being able to ask, what if something different were really going on here? And I like this quote by Buckminster Fuller. You cannot change how someone thinks, but you can give them a tool to use which will lead them to think differently. That's it. Love that quote at the end. And actually, so I just loved every every bit of the that the presentation. You know, the way um <clears throat> the the way you talk about um, how we think we think versus how we do think um, was a completely different way than than I had presented and very creative and actually more direct. So I thought that was very elegant. Um, the way you talked about scripts, the way you talked about stories and the three ways of grounding just really gave everybody um, a good grounding. And you can use that by, you know, <clears throat> you can use that to then encourage them um, the people that you're presenting to, to say, and I can come back, you, you know, you can come back and we can do, do a session on each one of these techniques if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And you could yeah. actually do the circuit, you know, like <laughs> I think you you could use this for teachers all, all, all over Washington. Yeah. I love, can I tell you when you said scripts, there is a good thing to scripts, like, because even in my mind, it, you know, when Mitch and I talk about scripts, I always go straight to that scripts are bad. And they're, you're right. They're extremely useful in really, really many ways. So I love that. And of course, I love Buck, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> um, but but the other thing that caught caught me um, off guard was on the slide when it said, what if that's, no, what if that's, what if there's a different story? 
right? Even that yeah. gentle, what if that's just not even the story? It, I mean, even that gentle reminder is very powerful. Very powerful. Well done. Well done, Annie. Thanks. What are you presenting? Uh, I'm not invited to present yet, but I I could um, consider doing this at the Washington School Counselor Conference next mm -hmm. um, next year. So, mm -hmm. are you close to ESD 101? No, I am actually in ESD 112. I'm on the yes. other side of the mountains. <laughs> She's I'll on see. the other side, but I can tell you, Weira is Weira. I don't know if you know Weira. They're looking for <clears throat> proposals as well, and I think it would be great there. Oh, thanks. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is great. People should see this. People should see this and listen to you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. presenting. Okay, so I think we have, you know, we have certainly time for one more. Is somebody who wants to present? No one. Okay, well, it's not it's it's not obligatory, uh, but um, I have to say again, you know, the five of you who presented, you know, Tori, Lee, John, Nicole, Annie, um, <clears throat> these were great. Um, you know, I, I you know I learned from you all during the sessions, and I especially learn from you all when you when you do these presentations, and um, and you have this spreadsheet now that you can access, you know, each other's lessons and actually the lessons from the people who came this winter. So uh, hopefully that gives you things that you can present either to other teachers or to students that um, to help others learn how to use their minds better. So thank you for participating. And um, uh, any questions, Any anything anybody would like to ask before? before summer break. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to encourage a couple of my colleagues to do this class. And you mentioned um, you think you're going to run it again in the fall. Was that like September, yes. October? Um, so I don't remember, me... Mitch. I know we have the dates on the calendar. I don't. Okay. I, um, let's see. So let me, give me one second. Uh, I so have Mitch, the... while you're looking that up, I do want to tell everybody <laughs> here the clock hours we're giving everybody an extra week to turn in their lesson so after next week i will turn in the clock hour form so after that you should be seeing you know if you don't see the the clock and she actually does it really quickly but i will tell you for the first time in 14 years it glitched the last time i did it and i don't know if it was her on her end or my end but i kept getting emails about clock hours i'm like god i submitted those so i contacted our clock hour lady and she's like tammy i don't I don't have that attention. And I'm like, so I said it again. Um, and she did it immediately because she knew I'm like, wow, I, I submitted that weeks ago. And I don't, again, I don't know where it glitched and I don't really care. We, we just fixed it right away. So if you don't see the clock hour, there should be an email. You click on it. It'll ask you to take a survey. Survey's not a big deal. Once you click the survey and take it, it'll, 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 it'll pop up and say, you can get your clock hours now. So FYI, that's how that's okay. going to work. Okay, so the um, Mind Shifting 1 will start Tuesday, September 19th. Then Mind Shifting 2 will start October 12th. And then Mind Shifting, Mind Shifting 3 will start January 16th. So okay. those are the three dates for the Mind Shifting 1, 2, and 3. Perfect. Thanks, man. Thank you. Sure. Hope okay. to see you. I'm going to go make dinner. Have a great evening. Yeah, have a, I'll, I'll stick around in case people have questions. I'm going to stop the uh, recording.